Welcome back, Hope City Church Online. Stoked to be with you in our fourth week of the series, Selfless, where we're looking at the idea of what does it look like for me to make more room for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life and to resolve myself, to focus myself on others, to be selfless, to think of myself less and think of others more. And by doing so, being more Christ-like and be and, and enlarge my container, the vessel in which the Holy Spirit dwells, so that I can have more of his power and his presence. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, each week we've read this verse together. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. That this selfish lifestyle is not the lifestyle of a follower of Jesus. The selfless, the servant mentality. If you want to be great, you must be a servant. If you want to be first, then get to the back of the line. It's counterintuitive. I know it, but you see it in the lives of Jesus and the way that he lived his life and the way that he motivated his life. And of course, the followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, the you know whether it's the actual 12 apostles or those who would come later, like the apostle Paul himself, um, you know they get it. In fact, Paul writes, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, he tells the church at Corinth that whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. In other words, even if it's mundane, even if it's boring, even if it's like work that you feel like is beneath you, even if it's something that you don't want to be doing, do it for the glory of God. And, and he's not speaking in some hypothetical, he's not speaking like, I don't know, some college professor that's never actually done it. He's actually lived this in real time. I mean, Paul's been beaten. He's been left for dead. He's been shipwrecked. He's been bitten by a snake. I mean, he's been ran out of town. He's been called names. I mean, Paul has, you know, all kinds of things that have happened. He's been imprisoned, and yet still Paul, right, says, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Honor God with your identity. Honor God with the basic in your mundane, in your everyday. And this concept that Paul's talking about goes back to, you know, a time or a philosophy all the way back into the Old Testament of what it looks like to honor God with your life. I mean, you can see it in the Shema. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, like Moses gives this to Joshua as you tell your children these things, as you walk along the road, as you wake up in the morning, as you sit down to eat together, as you put them to bed at night, remind them of this. Take these rules and write them on the doorpost, not of your heart, but actually of your gates and your vet and your buildings. And, you know, tie them around your arm, keep them on your head. Like, and he, he almost goes as far as to say, like, tattoo this concept of love God, love others on your body. He doesn't actually use that language, but he's, he's, he's getting pretty intense tense about it. And when he talks about this idea of working as if it's for the glory of God. Now, so many of us, we have jobs or roles or places and we're at, and we're climbing the corporate ladder, the social ladder, and we're trying to have more and, and we want to have bigger houses and more stuff and better things. And, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I'd like to have more and I'd like to get there. And so I'm doing all this work so that I can have this reward and, you know, I really would love to challenge your thinking today on that, that so many of us are working for the weekend, so to speak. So many of us are striving, you know, so hard in our everyday just to get that two weeks vacation once a year. You know, like we're, we're just pushing and grinding and gritting our teeth and powering through and we're missing out on the blessing. And, and here's what I, I'm wanting to challenge you. What if, you took this verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, and you really applied it as sort of like a, an overlay over every area of your life. What if you did everything that Paul says here? Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. What if the work itself, I know this is crazy, but what if the work itself is the reward? What if the prize is what you're learning in the process. What if you could learn to actually be grateful in the grind, not just when the grind ends, when it's time to clock out at the end of the day? Now, I know this is crazy talk. You're like, 
pastor, you've lost it. Like, are, are you high? What's happening? No, I mean this. Like, what would it look like for you to be grateful in the grind? What would it look like for you no matter what you're doing? Because Paul, he gets this. It's like, you know, like he's been arrested. He's been persecuted. In fact, look at verse uh, you know, chapter 15, verses 9 and 10 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is speaking. He says, for I'm the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle, right? And so Paul is sort of, you know, called an apostle. That phrase apostle, it's, it's supposed to be a follower of Jesus that actually saw Jesus face to face. So to become, to be called an apostle or a disciple of Jesus, um, you know, a lot of us are disciples, but to be an apostle it would mean that you were you saw Jesus face to face. Now, now, Paul spent the better part of his life trying to destroy the work of Christianity um, in its very like formative years. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and then Paul is the scripture describes it as he's he's sneaking around, breathing out murderous threats. Um, it's believed that when the the community st- stoned Stephen, that Paul held their coats while they threw rocks at Stephen until he almost died. And yet Paul, on a, on a trip where he was, you know, papers in hand to persecute the church, um, on the road to Damascus is met by a bright and shining light and the voice of Jesus from heaven appears to him and, and some sort of uh, imagery or effigy of Jesus appears to him in the moment. And he says, Paul, why are you, Saul, you know, why are you persecuting me? And, and then he's blinded by the light. Um, he travels to Simon's house and then, you know, like he, he waits there and then, you know, like the, the man that's waiting for him is scared to death. And so, you know, then, then the scales fall from his eyes and, and then he can finally see. He dedicates his life to Jesus and there's this powerful moment. So he becomes called an apostle because he has this face to face. He becomes in proximity to Jesus, um, you know, in person, face to face. And so that's what gives him that. So when he says, I'm the least of the apostles, he's like, I'm not even one of the OG 12 guys. I don't even deserve to be called that. Because I'm the one who used to persecute them and the church. And then listen to what he says. But, come on now. Everybody say but wherever you are right now. Turn to someone next to you and say but. But, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He's like getting all kind of slim shady right now, isn't he, right? He's like, I am what you said I am. Yes, but by the grace of God, I'm where I am. Yes, but by the grace of God, you find me in this moment now. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. I'm the least of them. In fact, I used to persecute them. But, come on, but by God's grace, I am what I am. I'm where I'm at today because of Jesus. I'm where I'm at today because he met me on that road to Damascus. I'm where I'm at today because I used to murder Christians, but he turned me into the person who brings more people to Jesus and writes more of the New Testament than any other author. I mean, second to Jesus, Paul becomes the most famous person in Scripture in many ways. Most of the Christian experience is defined by Paul's writing, the way that we interact with each other, the way that we treat each other, the rules that we've built into our congregations and our churches as we know them today are more oftentimes like shaped by Paul's teachings based off of Jesus's lifestyle than actually the words of Jesus himself. Now, that's problematic in its own way, but here's the deal, right? He's saying, look, I am who I am because God's grace, God's grace makes me who I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. His grace changes Paul. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, and there it is again, but the grace of God that was with me. Come on, let me think about it right now. What's your butt story? Like, you know, here Paul's breathing out murderous threats. He literally was traveling oftentimes with papers that gave him the right to put other people to death because of their faith in Jesus. And here now God's using him to build the kingdom. Your butt story. And he's like, yeah, I worked hard, but I didn't do it. 
I didn't do it by myself. I only accomplished it because of God's grace. It was his grace that made it possible. It's that but God moment that changes everything. It's that moment in time. That's why Paul's able to write to the church at Corinth. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Because you didn't do it anyway. God's doing it through you. And once we get it through our heads that we can actually be grateful in the grind, that the work can be its own reward, that the prize can be the process, then everything that we do becomes an act of worship, which makes open-handed living being easier, which makes servanthood so much easier, which makes thinking about other people more and telling our testimony. When you are the guy who shows up early and stays late and helps other people out and your boss is like, why are you always willing to do that? Well, listen, man, I'm a Christ follower, and I just believe that everything I do is as if I'm doing it for God himself. So I just like I like to just believe that Jesus owns this company, not you. And so I work for Jesus. And you should just be like thinking about how cool it is to have people like like Christians that work for you, that work for Jesus. I tell you what, there would be a, a revival and a revolution that would happen in your workplace if more Christians were grateful in the grind. And so you have this but story, this story of how God's grace has helped you. And so you're trying to be grateful in the grind. You're trying to find the the prize in the process. You're trying to find the work and let it become its own reward. But there's these enemies of that true reward. The enemy of the true reward. And, you know, I wanted to give you an easy way to remember them. So I'm going to give you three things today if you're taking notes Three things. It's kind of one point with three parts. And these are the three enemies of the reward. The first one is this. It's the pillow. The pillow. The pillow is the seduction of comfort. You've all felt it before. There's something about when you're in bed at night and you're laying there and your pillow gets warm and you flip it over and then you get the cool side of the pillow and you're like, oh, that's so good. That's so good. Why why can't they invent a pillow? I know they have like pillows that are supposed to stay cool. Uh, I saw an infomercial one time for the Chillo. Uh, bought one. It was garbage. Sorry, Chillo people. Sue me if you want to. Your pillow stinks, right? Your Chillo doesn't work. Um, you know, like there's something about that. There's something about the human condition, right? That it 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 we're we're lulled into a sense of comfort. And the life of following Christ, we started the day out today, we started every week this last four weeks together with this, is not supposed to be a life simply of comfort. I mean, you can look at Paul's story, you can look at Jesus' story. I mean, let's look at Matthew chapter 16, 24, what Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to be my follower, must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. He doesn't talk about putting on comfy shoes, he says, pick up a cross He's using the metaphor of what it was going to look like for him to carry a cross three and a half miles up a hill to Calvary to then be hung on it and die, sacrificially giving his life for others. You want to be my disciple? Come and die. That's, that's intense, right? It's not about comfort. It's about being willing to sacrifice my comfort for other people. And again, The problem, though, is that culture tells us that comfort is king. And so we want a new house that's got more space and and maybe it's, you know, whatever you don't have now. So you want a house with like granite countertops because you have Formica countertops in your current house. Or you want a house with an open floor plan because your house is all chopped up. Or, Or maybe it's a new car because you want a car that, you know, like has windows that are power windows that actually work or you know, you want a, a car with heated seats. Oh man, I rode in a car not that long ago that had heated seats. So nice. Long car trip. The chair's warming up my low back and my butt. And I get out of the car. No pain from seating so long. And then I get back in my little truck and I'm like, yeah, I don't have heated seats. And the allure of comfort will convince you to take your generosity and misplace it. And you don't have time to serve, and you don't have time to share, and you don't have time to to be there for the people that God's entrusted to you because the pillow is calling your name. The pillow wants you to settle for comfort. But Jesus didn't die so that I could be comfortable. He died so I could live dangerously. The second thing, if you're taking notes this morning, that is an enemy of you really getting to 
that level of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where whatever you do, you can do it for the glory of God, where the work is the reward, where the prize is in the process, where you can be grateful in the grind. The second is this. It's the shiny, it's the new, it's the distraction, right? Probably the biggest distraction in our lives nowadays um, would be, I don't know, smartphones, maybe streaming apps, um, <laughs> maybe sporting events, whether they're kids or uh, you know, amateur or even, you know, like, like professional sporting events, they steal a ton of our time and our focus. And if we're being really honest with ourselves, when it comes right down to it, at the end of it all, I mean, don't beat me up here, but they don't really matter. They don't really matter. Like on your deathbed, nobody's going to go like, you know what? He was really good at watching soccer. You know, he always had the fight on Saturdays. You know, that's not the stuff that people are going to remember. It's not going to be, you know, like how big your house is or how fancy your car is. It's not going to be the things that distract you. He had the latest phone and he had all the streaming apps. I want you to think about the shiny thing. I mean, the devil uses these things. And again, the the phone and the and the you know Netflix isn't the devil himself. I'm just saying if the devil can use Netflix, he will though. And maybe I'm aging myself by saying Netflix because there's so many streaming apps out there. And if you're old school, maybe it's not even the streaming apps. Maybe you just waste time watching QVC. Whatever it is, and however you're doing it, I'm just saying there's a lot of shiny things, and those shiny things tend to be accompanied with ads and marketing that are always trying to get you to spend money on something you don't need. Heck, most of the time, you don't want. I mean, I already told you, I bought a Chillo. What an idiot. <laughs> Come on. I don't need it. I don't want it. It didn't make my life better. But the TV told me so. The ad told me. How many people get sucked in to, you know, fake scams on emails. I get probably 10 or 15 a week. I don't know if it's I'm of the age now where they think I'm going to fall for them. But like 10 or 15 a week where it's like, we need to get a hold of you because we've got this gift we want to give you, this Amazon gift card, this Walmart gift card. It's like the same email with just a different vendor every time. And all you have to do is click here and give us your information. And you're like, so you can drain my bank account. Yeah, great. And that's not going to happen, right? I didn't fall for the Nigerian prince. I'm not going to fall for this either. But it's the shiny thing. It's the getting something for nothing. It's the, you know, well, if I had that, my life would be better. And you could go back to the comforts. And sometimes the comfort and the shiny thing are one and the same. Like if I could get that, you know, new truck. I'll tell you what right now. <clears throat> my little pickup truck is, uh, it's an 03 S10 little work truck. You've seen it at church before. It's got the the camper shell on it and the roof rack on it and it gets me where I need to go and it's got good gas mileage and you know and everything and and there's days though that you know I have to take my big old body and fold it up to get inside that little truck and get where I need to go to get, accomplish what I need to do and and I'd like to have more but I'm choosing to drive the beater the old vehicle to be honest with you that I never even had to pay for was gifted to me I'm choosing to drive that because it gives me the ability to be more open-handed in my life. And while it might be fun to have a more comfortable, more fancy, more elegant truck, I don't need it to accomplish my job because the amount of construction that I do these days is two, three days a week, if that. And I don't need to carry the heavy stuff that I used to carry back in the day because I don't do that anymore. So I don't need it as a tool to provide for my family. I just need the little one I have. So going out of my way to just be in debt to someone else so that I can have more comfort and more shine doesn't make a lot of sense now, does it? Instead, I'd rather be grateful in the grind. Come on. I'd rather realize that the process is the prize and that the work is its reward and that I can do everything as if I'm doing it unto the glory of God. Whether I'm in something brand new or I'm something old, whether it's something I've had before or I'm never going to have ever again, I get it. Now, Paul talks about this concept 
throughout his teaching. And he says, you know, this that I've been, you know, someone who's had a lot and I've been someone who's had nothing. I've been free and I've been locked up. I've been hungry and I've been fed. I've been naked and I've been clothed. I've been stripped down and beaten. I've been set free. Here's Paul's a Roman citizen and yet he's put in prison by the Romans. Paul gets it and yet in all of it, he chooses to keep on keeping on. He chooses to keep on pressing towards the purpose and the plan. The third enemy of true reward that comes in, and I call it the towel, it's the perpetual temptation to just give up, to just quit. Right? Like, I can't do it. It's too much. Right? Like, like I, I, I got a difficult marriage, so I might as well just give up and get a divorce. I'm going to cut ties and get out while they're getting this good. I've tried to get out of debt, but... It's just too hard, and I, I failed, and, and I spent a bunch of money that I shouldn't have, and so now I'm, I'm back where I started, so, so just I might as well just give up. I'm not good enough. I'm not capable. You know what? My parents are right. I'm stupid, so I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to give up. Maybe it's been a diet that you were on or some resolution. I mean, here we are four weeks into the new year. I'm sure we've all blown our resolutions at this point because that's what happens when we resolve to be selfish but when we resolve to let god change us from the inside out you can grab the towel that temptation to perpetually quit to throw it in right and you could grab that towel and you could wipe the sweat from your brow and you can get back to work because i believe that the work can be its own reward the prize can be found in the process and that if you work at it in the name of Jesus that you can learn to be grateful in the middle of the grind paul talks about it like this he says however i consider my wife my life worth nothing to me my only aim is to finish the race this is the man who's been beaten and and abused and shipwrecked and left for dead and he says the only, the only purpose, my only aim is to finish the race, complete the task that the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace, the telling the story of God is good and his grace is sufficient, that I was nothing. I don't even deserve the accolade that I'm getting, but I get it because of the grace of God, the but God story that he has right there. Pick up the towel, wipe the sweat from your brow and start working. And what he's talking about in this moment is he's, he's putting passion in front of, right? And this is what so many people do, passion in front of purpose. And Paul's saying, no, 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 purpose over passion. I don't think Paul was passionate. I'm sure there were things that Paul was passionate about. Scripture doesn't really talk about them much, you know? We know that he was, you know, like... You know, like he had a job and a role and the things that he did as he traveled and he learned trades and he did things and, you know, that he, that he tried to provide for himself. But, you know, like I don't think Paul was passionate about being shipwrecked. Oh, Lord, I hope we get shipwrecked this week. I don't think he was passionate about getting bit by a snake in his travels. I don't think he was passionate about being locked up. I don't think he was passionate about being beaten and whipped and mistreated and talked about. I don't think he was passionate about any of those things. This is part of the problem is that we live in a culture where they tell everybody to follow your passion. Listen, there's nothing wrong with following your passion, but your passion will only get you so far. You'd be better off to find out what your purpose is. It's the big question. Because when you understand your purpose, you understand 1 Corinthians 10, 31. My purpose is no matter where I find myself, no matter how hard the work is, no matter how rough the situation the circumstances i'm going to keep on pressing i'm going to keep on keeping on i'm going to keep on pushing because whatever i do i do it as if, as if i was doing it to the lord himself because i believe the work is its own reward when you do it in the name of jesus i believe that the prize is in the process when you do it in the name of jesus i believe that you can learn to be grateful in the grind because you realize that it's not about it's not about my passion. It's about my purpose. Paul says his purpose is to use his testimony to point people to God's grace. That's all of our purposes. I mean, you can talk about it in any way you want. Every church is supposed to have the same 
mission vision statement. You can call it bringing hope to the world one person at a time, or you can call it, you know, like changing lives in Jesus' name, or bringing people who are far away to God closer to God, or leadership development, or you can call it whatever you want to call it. But the truth of the matter is, is that we all really have the same purpose, and we just, you know, try to give it a fancy name. It's to help people to find Jesus. It's to help people connect with God in meaningful ways. It's to take the hope of Jesus to every person that we come into contact with. And I don't know a greater way than to do it than to be grateful in the grind. When people see you being grateful in the grind, they go, wait a minute, there's something different about you. When you pick up the towel, you wipe the sweat from your brow, and you say, I choose purpose over passion. And so in my ordinary, in my everyday, I'm not telling you I'm never tempted to quit. I just reject the towel. I'm not going to throw it in. I'm going to pick it up and write the sweat from my brow and keep working. I'm not telling you that I'm not distracted by the shiny thing. I, I like new stuff, new things. I want more. But I choose to temper my attitude towards feeling like I don't have enough to realizing that, you know what, the bag isn't enough. The basket is full, but yet my barn is overflowing. Why? Because I put Christ first in the middle of my finances. And I'm not going to let the seduction of comfort, the pillow, keep me from accomplishing the plans and the dreams that God has for me. I'm not going to settle for comfort because comfort isn't what I'm striving for. I'm not working to just go to bed at night in my comfy bed. I like my bed. It's comfortable but I don't want to spend my whole life there. I want to experience the wins and the losses, the ups and the downs, and I realize something. The older I get and the more revolutions around the sun I have, that whenever I do whatever I do as for the glory of God, that the work is my reward and that my prize is found in the process and that I can be grateful even in the grind. Thank you.